our next speaker, so Professor, uh, Professor Aleja Alexandra Balzac from uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure and the Laboratoire de Physique. De, uh, de Physique. And her recent research is focuses on the number of concrete and not disjoint topic as gene regulatory networks, uh, collective behavior, the immune system and population genetic. She studies the behavior of uh, such a strongly coupled nonlinear systems that are not in equilibrium, mostly inspired by a system biological solution. Her main interest lies in the description of system at the cellular scale, for example, understanding the link between function, development, and evolvability of conserved pathway and their elements. The talk, uh, the title of her, her talk today is The Scales of Viral Host Coevolution. So, welcome, Alexander. Okay. Thank you. So, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Everything's fine. Okay, so I can start? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much for this invitation. Um, and I'm going to be talking about scales and predictability today. And this, I'll, I'll try and sort of walk you through two sides of the same picture, one on the viral and one on the host uh, evolution side. And this is work done in collaboration with Thierry Mora. And for the viral side, we work with Jacobo Marchi and Michael Lessi. And for the um, co-evolution side, with Andreas Maia and Vijay Balasabhumani. Sorry, for the host immune side. So let me just try start a little bit sort of stepping back and explaining why I'm interested in, uh, in predicting in general, because all living systems predict. So when, I mean, in, we're, I'm in France right now in Roland Garros, so the French Open is on. So, you know, these people hitting balls, they're integrating unconsciously equations of motion to predict where the ball will be at the, at the future time. So we could say that they're trying to maximize the information between the input at the past time and the response at the later time. And there's many different ways of doing this. And it's an interesting question in neuroscience to ask why. Another example of prediction uh, is finding sources uh, of odors in, in turbulent environments. So a male moth, which is born uh, with enough energy and no digestive tract uh, for, for with enough energy for 48 hours or so, has that time to find a female. And the question is, how can uh, it do it, knowing that, well, it's sort of flying around in air in a turbulent environment. And one idea that was proposed uh, by Massimo Vercasola and Boris Schreiman and collaborators was that maybe they're maximizing the entropy reduction rate. So they're doing a, a, a combination of exploration uh, by gathering data and exploitation by doing a maximum likelihood search in the, based on the map, on the probabilistic map that they built. Uh, another idea close, another sort of problem of prediction closer to what we'll be talking today is predicting future viral strains. So in the old days, this was mainly done for the flu, but of course now we have a new favorite virus to think about. Uh, but the problem is more or less the same that uh, scientists all over the world are con collecting existing viral strains. And for the flu, they would get together in February uh, for the North Hemisphere to predict the dominant strain for autumn of next year. And uh, so physicists have gotten involved in that because, of course, revolution, evolution is a highly non-equilibrium and random process. Uh, and by writing down equations for how the frequencies of different strains change as a function of time due to different fitness effects, so how fast they grow, um, and having sort of biophysical models for what constitutes fitness, so the growth rate, and integrating this with data and probabilistic inference, they're able to make predictions which of the observed strains in February will actually be the dominant one a few months down the road. And as you can see from here, the prediction works pretty well on the short timescales. Uh, and the question is, can we actually make this 
extend this to longer time scales if we understand how the viruses interact with the immune systems of the world. And another question that we have, and I'll get back to at the end of my talk, is that as you can see that in biology, a lot of biological system predicts. So one question that we're interested in is, uh, do our own immune systems actually try to predict the future, uh, future states of pathogenic environments? So when we do this prediction, we do it from the sort of perspective of the great observer, where we've collected all the, path all the flu strains in the world. But of course, we as individuals, we luckily do not uh, experience all the flu strains in the world at a given time. We sample just the proportion of that. Yet our immune systems have to be prepared for the future strain uh, that may infect us. So is there a way that our immune systems, which I'll tell you more about and are distributed, um, basically distributed statistical machines are able to modify their composition in such a way to be prepared for uh, future viral infections. So that's why prediction is going to be a main sort of theme of what I'll be talking about. But let's first talk about viruses, because if we're interested in predicting viruses, let's first learn a little bit about how they evolve. So here you see a lineage tree of uh, flu strains from the six, less, late 60s until today. And you can see that it's a linear tree, meaning that there are no splits in the tree and that the new strain comes from the previous one. We have one trunk driving evolution. We have relatively low selection. This is at the population worldwide level and strong selection. However, there are different modes of evolution. So this is one strain of the flu. This is flu, flu A, this is flu B, another strain of the flu that's also circulating. And here you see uh, that splits in fact are possible. And there was a split that happened uh, in the late seventies. And now we have two coexisting lineages. So sometimes splits can happen and there are these two different modes of evolution if we are building lineage trees, right? So what are lineage trees? We take the existing uh, uh, viruses. Bro, Alexandra, Alexandra yeah. can you minimize the window, a small window in the corner? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. let me, sorry. Let me, I can close it. This one, right? Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, okay. All right. So anyway, so we can have these different modes of evolution. And one question is what drives the different modes of evolution? And just to sort of set the stage of how we can think about it. So that, that was just building trees, basically building genealogies in the same way that Meran talked about the genealogies in his, uh, in his fronts. Here, uh, we also ask about the dimensionality of the film and a more sort of a phenotypic approach. And people have done that uh, by building what are called ag maps. So basically, they take a given viral strain, in this case, the flu, and they try it, they, they sort of put it in a bit of blood, in this case, ferret, but it doesn't matter. But basically, they try to see uh, which flu strain will elicit the response, well, which immune repertoire will manage to protect itself against this flu in a sort of artificial setting. And then the similar response for the different flu strains, the closer they are in this map. So you can translate the sort of the tree like we just saw into, in this case, a two-dimensional map. So what this is, it's a projection onto a two-dimensional space. It's dimensionality reduction. Uh, the question of whether it's really two dimensions is the relevant uh, dimension is actually a very important one and we don't know. And that this is some, one of the questions that we, we would like to ask. Okay, and this is just the same thing for more sort of recent uh, flu strains of these antigenic maps, where basically the closer they are, the more similar they are in the sense of how, what kind of immune response uh, they elicit. So this 2D antigenic space um, takes us back to another theoretical idea that dates back to Perils in the 80s, of shape, shape space or recognition space. So here, this is an abstract phenotypic space where 
uh, immune receptors and viruses will live in the same space. So these are these are immune receptors and um, or antibodies, since as we now all know, antibodies are part of the immune system. And basically, we assume that viruses and immune receptors antibodies li live in the same space. And the closer they are in this space, in terms of Euclidean distance or any other measure you want, but basically just real distance, uh, the more similar they are to each other, and the more similar they are to each other, the more likely they are to recognize each other. So, however, not only th the virus doesn't have to fall exactly where the antibody is, it can fall within what's called the cross reactivity ball. So you can either think of them as spheres in D dimensions, or you can think about them as little Gaussians, but that's the basic idea is what's drawn here. And I'm drawing it in 2D because it's easier, but again, we don't know what the dimension of this very abstract, very phenotypic space, which we're just gonna use as something to help us deal with these two sides of the story, right? Um, so, because of this cross reactivity, if a virus finds itself here in this shape space, that means it will be recognized both by this antibody and this antibody. If it finds itself here, it can be recognized by all three and so on. So you will see that this is a very important concept uh, that comes into play. And as I said, we don't know what's the dimension of the space. It's being postulated to be between five and eight. Uh, however, it could be lower and Essentially, I mean, I can give you arguments for why people put forward five, but it's it's not more convincing than any other dimension. Uh, above nine dimension, random packing becomes as good as non-random packing. So maybe there's a reason we're probably below nine dimensions, uh, but you know we don't know. Okay, but we'll be working in this space, so that's why it's it's very important. And I'll first introduce the most simple. Um, model. This is a sort of purely numerical agent-based model where I have a host. In each host, I have a certain number of immune receptors, antibodies that protect this. In host, again, described by this, uh, by this phenotypic antigenic space. And viruses infect hosts, so viruses also have their place in this antigenic space. And then viruses can mutate. Uh, and uh, so, of course, each host infects uh, R0 of a host, okay? We all know what R0 is, it's the mean number of uh, people infected or hosts infected by, uh, by a, a given host. And when it infects it, it can either infect it with the same strain, with the old strain, with the unmutated, then maybe this new host will have protection against the strain or maybe not. If it does have protection, then it'll clear the virus with existing immunity. Or a host can also be infected with a mutant strain and maybe it won't have protection for this mutant strain. Of course, you know, for both scenarios can happen that a, mutant, a host infected with the non-mutated strain can also not have uh, immunity. And if it doesn't have immunity, that means it has to, it'll get, it'll get an immune response, it'll get the disease, but it'll also develop immunity, right? That's how the immune system works when you get infected by a pathogen, then your immune system tries to clear the pathogen and due to, do, as part of that, you develop an, an immune response and then you have immunity or protection against this pathogen and so on. And then these, of course, this person who cleared won't infect anybody, but this person that didn't will continue infecting. So if we solve this model numerically, uh, we find four main evolutionary trends. Uh, so again, this is now the picture in, in phenotypic space, and this is the picture in terms of lineage. So the first plot I showed you from the data. Uh, and the first one is ballistic motion, where we basically see a very straight uh, determined line and one well-defined low diversity uh, lineage. And this picture is basically of the virus being chased by a population of immune systems that's canalizing it and pushing it in a given direction. Uh, we can also see other motion, which is more diffusive, meaning that the lineage still looks the same. However, in antigenic space, we see that there is more motion and more sort of, it, it's not such a straight push, but there is more diffusion. Sometimes the lineage is split, 
and it can be transient splitting or it can be stable splitting. And in which case we recover uh, this sort of flu B scenario. And here we have this flu A like scenario. So the model is able to encompass what we see in data. Uh, it does it in different, so we can draw phase diagrams. We can ask in what regimes do we see uh, what kind of behavior. So one thing, so I, I, I so I'm sort of focusing on the number of lineages. We can also ask in what regimes do we see extinction? Uh, uh, so the was Moran was, was talking about and, and other. Let me just talk about the number of lineages. And we can see that if the virus doesn't jump far and doesn't jump often, then we're probably in this ballistic regime with one lineage. And to get this many, to get more lineages with splitting, we have to have a case where the immune pressure is strong. And so jumping far will kill the virus. So the virus in order to survive has to make long jumps and often. And in that case, uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the evolution becomes more random because if the jump is further, then it's likely to fall out for it to sort of explore more dimensions and then we can get splitting. And so here again, we get these um, two stable lineages. Here we get this. Okay, but this was just sort of to motivate and hopefully sort of the uh, the agent-based numerical model is clear and intuitive to everybody, but our idea now, what we'd like to do is now build a sort of uh, a more analytically tractable model, and we'd like to take all our quantities and change them into fields. So we're going to have a density field of viruses, which we're going to call N of X. So now I'm going to call my d-dimensional antigenic phenotypic space uh, x and I'm going to define a variable n of x which is the density of viruses and I'm going to introduce a field which corresponds to the immune memory and will also be a function of x which will be h and the, the picture is the same so we have the immune system which is sort of pushing the viruses the viruses will have a given fitness meaning that the fitter they are the more likely they are to reproduce. So the whiter it is here, the fitter they are. And we're gonna assume that mutations are rare so that the, we will be in a regime where we can describe the evolution of these viruses uh, in terms of diffusion. So they evolve of course by mutations, but in our antigenic space, this just corresponds to diffusion in this space. So this is the equation, this is a diffusion equation for the evolution of the viral density where we have growth which is proportional to the fitness of the viruses at the given time at the given place. And then uh, there's a diffusive term which corresponds to mutations. And we also have demographic noise coming uh, from small numbers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the immune system, so the, the immune field, the, the immune memory field, so basically immunity, the protection of the host also evolves. Uh, and uh, when a virus, so you acquire immunity through getting infected by a virus, so proportionally to the viral field. And then there's a compensatory memory loss term because you can't have infinite memory. So if you acquire new memory, new immunity against the virus, then you have to lose something else. So this is just a normalization term. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about these terms. So fitness, uh, we uh, assume is well proportional to the number of uh, individuals the virus can infect plus uh, the number of uh, injectable hosts which we describe as one minus the susceptibility of the host to a strain at position x so basically C is what we'll call immune coverage so that means that with at this given position there is protection against uh, the virus, which we describe as a sort of integrated kernel of uh, the host immunity. And so if you, one minus C means you don't have protection, and then you have M memory, so opportunities to have protection. So basically the fitness of the virus means uh, that the hosts do not have protection. 
And then uh, uh, two important, well, a, a few important things about these constants. So if we integrate the viral density over all of space, we're going to get the total viral population, which is also equal to the number of infected hosts, of course, because every time a host gets infected, uh, then, well, a new virus is created and new coverage is created. And this is not a constant number. However, the host population is constant. Um, and is, we assume that you know, hosts don't reproduce in this model. And uh, the memories uh, carried by each host are fixed. The number is n. And that's just the, so if we integrate the immunity field or the uh, immune memory field H, we get back the number of, of, uh, of memories that we keep fixed. And so this is where this compensatory uh, term comes from. And this term also combined with the prefactor gives an idea of the time scale for immune uh, memory turnover. Okay. And we measure time and the units of infections. So bottom line, we have a density field for the viruses described by a diffusion equation, and we have a density field for memory. And these two equations are coupled and will drive the evolution of our system. Okay, so we can simulate this system and uh, we'll get back the same behavior as in the agent-based model. Here we see the viral density moving through phenotypic space, and what it leaves is the trail of host immunity. So you see that everywhere where the virus went, you now have protection and this generates host immunity, this generates coverage. And if we look into more detail uh, at what's going on here, is we clearly see this wave of width sigma in the direction of motion and uh, sigma perp in the per per perpendicular direction. So this is what you see at any given time, this is a snapshot of the viral density. Um, and you, you saw it moving with a given fit, with a given speed v. So we can actually map this density now on to the fraction. You can probability density. So this is just the um, a projection of this density onto the fitness because each of this virus, so this is a density of viruses, and each virus here has a different fitness depending on where it is in space. And so if we do that, fitness is a one-dimensional vector, we recover this fitness wave where the viruses that are more fit grow faster, that are at the nose of the wave, and the ones that are at the less fit grow more slowly and they become extinct. And this is what gives us the motion of, of uh, a fitness wave. Okay, so fitness waves are something that statistical physicists like a lot, and they have been studied a lot by Daniel Fisher, Michael Desai, Igor Rosin, um, it's Herbie Levine, Bernard Derrida, uh, in his Boris Schreiman. And so we have a fitness wave theory in one dimension for constant population size. And seeing that we're clearly seeing a wave motion here, we'd like to make a link to that fit. Okay, so we have a few problems to overcome. The first is that we're in more than one dimension here, and at best two, as these simulations show. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that our viral density vector can be decomposed into a component in the direction of, in the main direction of motion of the wave. So the one that you see here and with where I drew the sigma variance, and we're going to say that the wave is driven in this direction, and then there's some motion in the perp other perpendicular dimensions. So we're going to do this, uh, assume this factorization, and uh, we're going to make a few more assumptions. We're going to assume that uh, it, there's an approximately constant fitness gradient. Uh, so that this is what's drawn here by these uh, by these lines. That the, per, that the mutations in the direction of motion, the perpendicular direction, are isotropic, meaning that they can be both beneficial and deleterious. Uh, and the mutations in the other directions are neutral. So basically, that means that all the selection is coming from these immune 
systems chasing the wave. And every, but of course, there's diffusion, so there's randomness, so you can also mutate in another direction. Okay, so if we make these assumptions, it turns out that we can map our, uh, our, our density equation. We, we basically plug this in and we do an expansion in the direction of motion and we recover the same equations that, well, specifically we recover exactly the same equation that uh, Richard Ney and Oscar Halacek uh, derived and before that Herbie Levine and left simmering uh, uh, for the motion in this main direction of motion, only that, uh, and the, the fitness wave description is linked to the diffusion coefficient that we had on the previous slide in the density equation D uh, for a scaling of S squared. And the fitness wave is linked uh, to, the, to the speed that we're actually seeing in the simulations in a linear way. And twice the equations have exactly the same form. And there remains one issue to deal with, which is actually very important. So basically what, I, what I'm telling you, and you know, I'm not going through the math, but I'm telling you to sort of trust me that after this factorization, I'm able to get back exactly the same form of this traditional fitness wave equation in one dimension. Uh, so that's good. That's all. However, there's a problem that I have a non-constant population size. My virus numbers fluctuate uh, and um, I, I can see that, that I have this continuous negative drift. So I have this selection pressure here, this SVT term uh, that is sort of, is a feedback term. So uh, we're going to help ourselves about the non-constant population size. That's a problem that's still remaining and we have to solve, but we notice that there is that can control this. So let's look into that in more detail. Basically what this tells us is that the population size is in fact regulated by immune pressures. So let me sort of show this in a little bit more of a cartoon. So here's our viral population. This is now our main direction of motion. For now, let's forget about the perpendicular directions of motions. Let's just focus on the main direction of motion. And I have the host immune systems uh, pushing me from behind. And let's assume that I increase my, uh, the, my number of viruses, okay? They grow. And so if they grow, that means that uh, also my hosts, the number of hosts, protected hosts grows, right? Because if the, the number of viruses is proportional to the number of infected hosts. So if there's more uh, hosts, then I now also have more immune pressure acting on them. So of course they moved along, uh, but so did the immune systems. And that means that my fitness decreases. And uh, if my fitness decreases of the viruses, that means that my population size will go down. So this is a sort of intuitive understanding of, the, uh, of this feedback mechanism coming from the host uh, immune systems and driven by this immune uh, turnover uh, time which results in the fact that overall, although the number of viruses fluctuates, it, reached a it reaches a fixed point, a stable point, a, a set point uh, that, that, is, that is more or less constant. So we make the assumption now of, the, uh, of using this sort of set point idea that the number of, the end, the number of viruses doesn't change a lot. And if we go back to our equation for the density, this equation, and we integrate it to get large n, we'll see that this corresponds to the fitness not changing a lot. And so that means that we set, uh, we set F0. So after we've expanded our, our fitness, we set F0 to zero. Uh, if we actually put in the uh, if we put in the, so remember that fitness was described, defined as R01 minus uh, the coverage. So I sort of, I can put, calculate, plug in the, the form for the coverage in this limit because then the equation becomes self-consistent. I can solve it. I can plug it in here. And 
look at this expansion. So if I, I basically want this form around uh, u equals zero, then um, I will find this condition coming from f zero equals zero. So uh, that, I mean, basically I derived the first Taylor term of that and then set it to zero. So that's where the R zero gets a one over M from, this is this one. And I get back this uh, velocity times uh, turnover time. So I can plug in the turnover time from here, which gives me a condition uh, for which fixes the, the population size, gives me a condition for fixing, well, I fix the population size, but gives me an actual expression for what the population size has to be. And at the same time, from the second term of this expansion, in the same limit, I can calculate the selection coefficient. So plugging this into the second order expansion term, which looks like that. And if I, I recognize the same term here, and here, so now I can ha I have a clear, simple equation which defines the uh, population size, the set point population size of the viruses uh, in terms of the velocity of the wave, the selection coefficient, and the number of hosts. And the number, the the number of viruses, so the number of infected hosts over the total number of hosts is what's called an incidence rate in epidemiology. Okay, so now we've solved two problems. We've solved the two dim the higher dimensionality and we've solved the problem of having a non-constant population size. Uh, and so we can completely go and use the results from previous wave theory. And as I said, we're, there's various flavors of this fitness wave theory, which I'm sure you're aware of if you've ever thought about this. We're going to use the version because we are in the limit, this diffusive limit, and we're going to take the results from Ney and Halachik and just write down with uh, the rescaling that we previously characterized of how the fitness wave and the speed are related to our parameters. Uh, we met, from there, we can just take the velocity uh, of the wave. And so what we have now is we've figured out what is the population size of the viruses and the velocity of the wave in terms of the parameters of our model. Okay. So we can compare this to simulations. So the, the, the viral uh, population size and the velocity, and you see that it agrees very well in both cases. Uh, we can also then move forward and sort of try to fully characterize the shape of the wave. So there we can turn to Fisher's theorem, which tells us that the, the time derivative of the fitness is equal to the variance of the fitness. The variance of the fitness we know uh, again, in terms of, since we know that uh, all our prop the velocity, the linear properties scale with S, so the variance will scale, scale with, the, uh, with the square uh, of S. So, and of course the derivative of the fitness uh, in time is just coming, comes from the second term in our expansion. So that's just S times P. So we get this relationship for, uh, which determines the the uh, sh the shape the the spread the second moment of the the variance of the wave and again you can see that numerically it agrees very well so now we've characterized the motion in this direction we can start worrying about the other direction and we can ask what is the variance in the perpendicular direction so here the important thing to remember is that the while evolution in the main direction of motion is under selection because it's pushed by the immune systems, in the other direction, it's purely neutral. So we just, we're just just uh, in the other directions in general. So we're just dealing with pure diffusion. So we can estimate how far a given uh, mutant will be found as a function of the diffusion fish and the time. And the time we're looking at here is the uh, time between any two chosen uh, chosen individuals in the population. So to do that, we build a lineage tree and we count the time uh, to the last common ancestor. So simply from this, then we get back 
the the value of uh, the variance in the perpendicular direction uh, as a function of these parameters. And again, we can go back to previous results where this mean value of T2, this coalescent time was calculated and it scales like one over D with this very weird numerical factor. And we can now see, so we now have a, a, a link between the variance in the main direction of motion with the variance in the perpendicular direction. And again, we can verify this in simulations that although that basically this shows that the mapping we're doing and using the results from the one dimensional theory is valid in this regime because the agreement is very good. But at the end of the day, we now have a full characterization of the shape of the wave in all possible directions. So what remains to be, do, to be done is to describe the evolution of the position of the wave. And for that, we will write down effective equations of motion. So let us remind ourselves that the motion is driven by the fitness gradient, it's driven by this, these immune systems. So this is the motion, um, the position of the, 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 the nose of the wave. Uh, in the is in the sort of main direction of motion, the parallel direction of, uh, is driven by that, plus this genetic drift, which describes the motion in the other directions. And so, of course, the fitness is the same thing as immune coverage because that's where it comes from. So we have coverage, which is basically this blue line. It's just an integration of all the past positions. Uh, of of the virus, the mod modulo basically this time scale for forgetting, and uh, we see that what this means is that we have this inertial motion. So if we didn't have this genetic drift, if we didn't have the other dimensions, evolution would always happen in a straight line because that's what this is. This is just the immune systems pushing out the way, but these other directions allow for angular diffusion. So this is the picture that we have, that if we now look at the direction of motion, of sort of the divergence from the main direction of motion, we'll see that it's diffusion that leads that, whereas the main motion, the, the, the sort of immune system um, fitness part, this inertial term would make it go straight. So we can define a persistence time scale which tells us over the time scale over which the motion is correlated to be in the same uh, direction. And we can use this equation to derive an effective, well, we can basically massage this equation that I showed you before uh, and derive an equation for this angular uh, diffusion, which at large times uh, has this form. So it's an effective diffusion in the space uh, of orientations. And uh, it, from this, we can solve it, or we can essentially directly read out the persistence time, which has this form. And what's important to note here is that it combines two terms. It combines both the innate memory of the immune system through tau, and through V, it, it, it accounts for the cross, for the previous coverage, for the cross reactivity with all the other uh, basically for, for what the cross reactivity gives you. So this ball is the immune cross reactivity. So all the other strains that you're protected against. So you have your own memory plus the memory that comes from the cross reactivity. And if we again use this F0 equals zero condition that we derived before that fixed the population size, we can rewrite this in this form to get a clear scaling with D. Again, we can verify that the theoretical result agrees with simulations. And what this is, what the persistence times is, is the time for a single virus to escape immunity. But, okay. And so what does it look like? Well, if diffusion is large, that means that the population size and the velocity will also be large and we have a small persistence time, right? So basically many mutations are gonna change direction a lot. Uh, if R0 is large or there's small memory, this speeds up the wave, but it also results in a small persistence time. So again, you're sort of, you know, doing very jagged random uh, motions. So what these limits tell us is that for a fixed number of hosts, epidemic waves move faster and change course more often uh, uh, 
and so are, are probably uh, less predictable. So, okay. So this is the time for a single virus to escape immunity, uh, but we have also, we can compare it to the uh, time for the viral population to escape immunity. So basically this is the time for the velocity way, for, for the, the, the time it's, it's, okay. Given that you're traveling with, with speed V, how much time do you need? to leave the cross reactivity radius. And since I set the cross reactivity radius to one here, this is where this one comes from. So this is the time for the whole viral population to escape immunity and not just for a single virus. So of course this time scale uh, is, is much smaller. It's much easier for the whole viral population to escape immunity than for one virus. And if you know this scales is one over V and before uh, I'm sure you don't remember, but V scaled is D to the two thirds plus some logarithmic corrections. Okay. And the thing to realize is that the, this single virus is driven by neutral evolution, right? This is basically the, the, the time scale for changing direction in, uh, in space. So it's driven by this neutral perp direction. And this is really driven by this parallel direction of escape. So this is this is the by the selected fast mutations and this is by the slow mutations. Both of these time scales are larger than the coalescence time of the virus, meaning how much time do you need for any two viruses to come to be traced to find the last common ancestor? And this is because this is just this time scale for viruses completely ignores the immune system. It's just the virus is there by itself. However, these timescales both account for the immune system working and having an effect uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the system. Okay, so uh, let me, so th this is basically now, now the motion, but can we use that to predict where the virus is going? Can we basically, what, is, what does this tell us about the predictability and the problem? So I'll go back to my same uh, angular diffusion equation, which is basically this inertial motion in, in, in angle space. And if I integrate this equation, I integrate, rather I calculate the, the correlator of this equation and I integrate it, I, result, I, I get back this scaling. Um, and I can I can define yet another time scale, which is the time scale for predictability uh, of the motion. Which is I ask uh, on what time scale does this variance in the angle direction become the same range as uh, the cross reactivity range? And this gives me this result, which now depends on dimensionality. So I see that higher dimensions mean more possibilities for deviation from the cause of motion, which means the motion is less predictable. And if the dimensions is small, I get this result where the, predict the pre predictability time is a geometric mean of the persistence time and the escape time. However, if the dimensions are large, then the predictability time can be much smaller uh, than this escape time, then that's for the virus to basically, for the viral population to escape uh, immunity. So I'm in a much harder predictability regime here because I basically have so many possibilities. So this is another reason why we may hope we have relatively small, um, we're in relatively small space. Okay, so the last phenomenon we have so maybe just a comment that the predictability timescale is not the same thing as the persistence timescale because the persistent timescale just tells us when will the virus change course. With the predictability timescale, we're asking on what timescale can we still point to where the virus will be? Okay, so that's why it's a smaller timescale. That's why it's on longer timescales, can you figure out whether the virus has changed course? And on smaller timescales, can you actually point to the direction where you'll find it? Um, and the last thing I want to mention here is the splitting that I started off with. So to calculate the splitting, I'll ask when do two side sublineages diverge so much that they're more than one cross reactivity range away from each other. 
okay? And again, as, as I said before, I set the cross reactivity range to one here. So I'm looking at this picture, and here I actually have to do a mean first passage time calculation, uh, which I don't have time to sort of even hand wavily reproduce. Uh, but the bottom line is I get a rate for linear splitting, which again, I can verify that this scaling works well um, numerically. But again, the important thing is that the splitting rate grows with dimension. So the more dimensions I have, the more possibilities I have to split, which is sort of something we saw in the similar, the, 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 the simpler simulations where we didn't go to higher dimensions. And so in higher dimensions, we get this departure from canalized, the, the departure from this canalized evolution. By canalized evolution, I basically mean this ballistic motion of being just pushed by the immune system becomes easier. And last thing, so the splitting rate is always much smaller than any, than the time, the persistence time on the prediction time. So splitting is much less likely than def deflections. Deflections basically happen a lot and splitting is still a rare phenomena, which is something again that we see in the data. So to summarize, we basically see this motion of the viral population as a wave, uh, which then results in this, uh, in, is this sort of immunity that we can describe the speed of the wave and show that it is much larger than actually the diffusion of the virus. So that there's a collective population effect for the motion of the virus. Uh, we can calculate its time. Uh, so how often it changes the direction and show how it scales and we can calculate the splitting time. And overall we have sort of cascade of uh, of time scales, where the time scale that depends only on the virus properties is much slower than the time scales that integrate and sort of have renormalized into it the effects of the immune system. And the our ability to predict the future state of the viral population depends on uh, what dimension we're in. Okay, and now I think I should stop. Right, because I've roughly been talking for 45 minutes. I had a second part, which I don't have time for. So I'll just stop here and take questions, unless I'm like completely miscalculating my time. Okay, so thanks a lot to Professor Walsat for your very nice talk. So we have time for questions, so people in the audience can ask for now. Okay, so Giuseppe Gaeta, you can ask. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, I wanted to ask how generic it is to have the splitting or the channel the evolution, as you say. Well, it, okay, Gen it, I mean, it's generic, it happens. Uh, it you know, I, I think the sort of the, let me, the numerical results in a way answered that maybe in the simple, I mean, I, that's the simplest way where I can show you that it's generic in like models will do this, uh, basically all kinds of models like this, but you have to be in the right parameter regime. So you have to have the strong uh, immune selection pressure. The other thing that happens that will sort of that 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 maybe makes it a little bit less generic that this is all conditional on non-extinction. Oh, so, <laughs> right. So extinction is actually uh, in these models is something that's quite likely. But if you condition on non-extinction, then there's nothing stopping splitting if you're in a regime with strong enough immune pressure that you're basically forcing because okay think about it this way if the virus if you have strong immune pressure and the virus doesn't jump far enough then it's just going to go extinct so you need to push it into a regime where it has to jump far enough and then when it jumps far enough it can jump in any direction 
because it's sort of over jumping the cross reactivity ranges and then splitting becomes natural. I think that's the intuition. That's clear. And can you say anything about the flu, which is not splitting? Well, the flu is splitting, right? I mean, the flu is uh, splitting. Okay. <laughs> right? I mean, there's, there's the flu way. that doesn't split and there's the flu that splits. So, you know, okay, you can ask the question whether the fact that we saw this, what, so, you know, we started collecting these records. I mean, seriously, we sort of started, we as humanity, we started collecting them in the 60s. Here they, uh, they, they, they seem to go back a little bit further. So the question is, should we be surprised, uh, you know, in, in sort of Daniel Fisher language, should we be surprised that uh, there was just one splitting event that occurred in the 70s and not more stable splitting events uh, of, of this sort of range? Uh, so, you know, is one a lot, is one to be expected? or is one is sort of too much. And so, I mean, you'd have to pl plug in the numbers exactly and you'd have to be very sure about the mutation rates. But I think what this theory shows is that this is roughly correct. That, you know, splitting events are there, but they're still quite rare, right? That's what my cascades of time scales shows. So that's what I can say about the flu. And I mean, we can actually calculate the, I, I don't remember the numbers now about the, but the, we did calculate the sort of time scales for the flu, for the persistence time and for the splitting time. I roughly agree with what we see. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Professor Munoz has also a question. Yeah, well, thank you, Alexandra for the, very insightful talk, as, as always. I have two Thanks. questions. Uh, first one is um, everything depends on the dimensionality of this space, the abstract space that you constructed. So, it, I mean, it's-, it's So not everything. Uh, not everything, many, many things. Well, not, okay. Everything. Yeah. Well, well, well uh, it, it's an important, very important parameter, right? So uh, first, is there any- Yeah, well, okay, so my, can I, can I- Yeah. You go 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 ahead, yeah. and I'll clarify. Well, maybe you can go with the clarification before. I mean, if it's so important. Uh, can we have any? I don't know. I wouldn't say experimental measurement of this type of thing. I, I understand that's extremely difficult. But some uh, theoretical or experimental or combined way to 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 bound what could be the dimension yeah. of this more more closely. So yes, okay. So first of all, just to let me clarify, and the short answer is yes, and that's what we're trying to do. So I mean, we haven't done it yet because this involves analyzing tons of data and you know being very careful. But this is we're trying to do this now, and this is basically one of the motivations for doing this. So what depends on the dimensionality of the system? So the prediction time scale depends on it, and the splitting time scale depends on it. But the persistence time scale, which is actually the thing that is more sort of data related. So the persistence time scale is easier to measure than the prediction time scale. Because the prediction time scale is, you know, something we would want, but how do you measure it from data, right? You, you sort of, you can a posteriori. The persistent time scale is easy, right? You just plot these things. It's like, it's, you know, it's a statistical mechanics problem then. You just need right. to get the data. And this doesn't depend on, on D, but it gives you an estimate of the other parameters, which then you can, you know, use the, so neither the speed. So actually what is interesting is that so many things, so the total population size, the speed of the wave and the persistence time scale don't depend on dimension. And you can use them to extract parameters that then from the splitting time scale or from the prediction time scale, you can try to get at the dimensionality. And this is like, you know, we would love to know the answer because in a lot of, the, so the other sort of 
optimal work we've done that I didn't have time to talk about, we make assumptions about the dimensionality of the space. And we always get asked the question of how do you know what it is? And every time I introduce shape space, people ask what it is. And I think a lot of people wouldn't care to know because also these projections onto antigenic maps assume two dimensions. Uh, then Boris Schreiman and Richard Nayer did a sort of similar calculation we did, but in infinite dimensions. And what we're showing here is that things actually do depend on dimension, that whether you're in low dimensions or in a sort of mean field infinite dimension, then the results are different for, the, for both the speed and for, for various properties. So in that sense, yes, and, and we'd like to get at that. And maybe, I mean, I think five years ago, I would have said it's a dream. Now I'm actually a little bit more optimistic. Very good. And do you think that an evolutionary innovation of a virus could expand the number of dimensions that you actually have in your space? So that you do something so weird that you are actually creating new dimensions. New dimensions. Uh, right, so it's a, it, that, that's an interesting question because it's, it's really a fun, like, the the immune system doesn't care how the virus virus manages it. It just cares whether it escapes. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. I mean, maybe you could think about that as creating new new dimensions. Yeah, it's like, for example, in evolutionary theory, when some guy invented the wings, you have a new whole niche to explore, and you expand eventually the the dimensionality of the the niche space of the yeah i mean okay in that sense the dimensionality is also an effective parameter that we can say that there is a real dimensionality and we're just seeing the you know we're seeing what has been explored right right so the fact that we're exploring a low dimensional manifold in this potentially high dimensional space okay right so, i think my last curiosity is not a question so what do you think about the coronavirus? It's a splitting, not a splitting? Will we chase well enough by the immune system? I, 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 you know, I don't, I think it'll be very similar to, 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 to flu. In the, it's just a matter of time scales. So yeah. it evolves more slowly. The mutation rate is, more, is slower. Um, but other than that, so far, you know, everything that has happened to the flu has happened, so. And you know, when it started, we were certain it's gonna mutate. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it did. <laughs> so I, you know, i it can I mean, you know, you can even say that the Delta strain, as it's now called, compared to the Brazilian strain is a split. I mean, I I think it's too early to say because you know, to see a stable split, you need time scales. Right, but what is this? Okay, so maybe this is something to bring it home for you. What is what is splitting? Splitting is going beyond uh, the cross reactivity radius. So splitting is having a new strain that your vaccine won't work for. Mm -hmm. So you can say that the Delta variant compared to with the AstraZeneca virus, it's a split. Good. I mean, bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, we're speculating it's Friday night now. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much again. Okay, so thanks, uh, uh, Professor Walser, for your very nice talk. So we have no time for more questions.